I hope you have your <clears throat> Bibles this morning. We're in the book of Romans. I'm going to run through just a few verses and by way of um, looking back and uh, just reminding ourselves that the theme of Romans really is the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. And uh, Paul, speaking of, of himself there in chapter 1 and verse 15, says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. God's righteousness only attained by faith, uh, not by works. In uh, chapter 3 and verse 20, he tells us, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know, many religions are founded on pride and people saying, I keep the law. I keep the rules. God says that's, that's not the way to righteousness. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, listen, there's nobody good enough. There's nobody so bad they can't be saved. Uh, the righteousness of, of God. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can be righteous, but only by faith, through Jesus, faith in Jesus. He talks about sanctification then in chapter 6 and, and 7. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's saying, should we keep living the old way before we were saved? He says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Yeah, God changes who we are. And then he changes how we live, how we walk, how, what we do, what we say. Later in that chapter, verse 14, he says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. We got a new master when we got saved. We got a new righteousness. We got righteousness, let's put it that way. Uh, only God can give that. Chapter 7 talks about the struggle. There, there's a difficulty. We're still in bodies. Uh, if you don't have a body, you're not alive. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, and we struggle until we're with Jesus and, and like Jesus. But he is changing us. In chapter 8, verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God says he's given you as a Christian his Holy Spirit. Let me read a, a fair portion here in chapter 8, starting in verse 31. What should we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. He's just saying, we're going to have lots of trouble. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. What a blessing. Our God is faithful. Amen. Our God is faithful. We can count on him. And then he illustrates it in chapters 9, 10, and 11 in Israel. Israel is God's amazing picture. There's nothing like Israel. I mean, really. Uh, what country has been out of their country for 2,000 years, and then all of a sudden, we're back. <laughs> it's just incredible what God has done and is doing. In chapter 9, he, he talks about uh, their, their past. 
You know, God chose Israel to be his, his picture, his channel. Uh, that's one of the reasons we sang that song. I wanted to, to sing that one that you were trying to sing. Uh, uh, they're God's channel of blessing to the world. But Israel stumbled at Jesus Christ. That's what he says in chapter 9, verse 31. Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Jesus is that stumbling stone for many and for, the, for Israel. They stumbled at Jesus. But you know, uh, chapter 10 deals with Israel presently. Uh, even though they've rejected Christ as a nation, uh, God had chosen them to be his representatives, to be his channel. Uh, you know, he intended for the world to be blessed through them. And Israel allowed all these things, you know, self-righteousness and legalism and uh, disobedience. At the end of verse 10, he talks about how they, they are disobedient and gainsaying, contradictory. Um, they, they let all of that block the channel. And so God went around them. And God gave us the, the church, a mystery uh, before. Now, I wanted to illustrate this. He's going to show you a picture. Uh, this is something that you never want to see that belongs to you, all right? You never want to see your heart. <laughs> uh, ten years ago, I had bypass surgery. Uh, they did uh, four bypasses. I, I saw a diagram of it, and I thought, ooh, I don't, I don't want to see that. I, I don't know if you can see this very well, but uh, this, this vein is blocked. And so they, that blue one is showing they bypassed it. Well, that's what God has done to, for Israel right now. Now, Jewish people, their still blood goes through this old vein, but it's just not, meant, not much. I had one of my veins was almost completely blocked, 99% or something. Um, I, I, when I first came to Brisbane here, I, I applied to play seniors basketball. Thank God they turned me down. <laughs> I'd have died on the court. I'd, I'd rather die in the pulpit. Uh, and God had chosen Israel to be that representative, the vein, you know. But because of legalism and pride and so on, you can go ahead and put that off there. We don't want to look at that too long. Uh, God went around them. But you know, they, they joined back up again. And uh, God is not done uh, with Israel. The present remedy for Israel is the same as for you and me. Uh, chapter 10 talks about uh, trusting Christ. Verse 11, the, the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And for Jewish people today, uh, their remedy for their heart problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. Same for you, same for everyone in the world. Uh, God's future remedy is that he's going to join them uh, back up. And that's what, that's what channel, uh, channel, chapter 11 uh, is all about. Verse 1, he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to, to preach this, and I've taken some time with it, there's a lot of false teaching going on about Israel. Uh, just be blunt about it. A lot of false teaching going on about Israel. Uh, you know, people say, oh, the, the church is Israel. No, we're not. Uh, you know, we're spiritually children of Abraham, but we're not Jews. We're not physically Jews. Um, and, and God is still dealing with them. And God is still going to, to use them. That's what chapter 11 is, is all about. God is not through with Israel. And in a sense, he calls five witnesses. We're going to look mainly at four here today. And the first one is Paul himself. Look there at verse 1. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Paul says, I'm a Christian. Uh, most of the, well, all the apostles were, were, were Jews. Uh, God uh, has not cast away the Jewish uh, people. He's not finished with them forever. Uh, you know, it's not so much that Paul was just that he was saved, but it was how he was saved. Paul was saved in an unusual way. I don't know if you, you remember the, the account that God gives. He's traveling along, and, and a light and a voice comes, and Paul's knocked off his beast. And Man, it's, it's pretty traumatic. 
Uh, he says this in, in 1 Timothy. Just listen to these verses. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Not just that he got saved, but uh, there's a pattern in how he was saved. I think, now you can disagree with me on this, I think this is uh, an indication of some of what's going to be going on during the tribulation when Jews are getting saved. It's going to be boom, they, you know, God's going to knock them off their feet and they're going, to, they're going to respond to him. Paul himself is personal proof. God's not through with Israel. Then he goes on, look at verse 2. God, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? So that's Elijah in the Old Testament. How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then there's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more works. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. Now, uh, th there's a lot of words in there, but he's just saying, just as God had a remnant in Elijah's time, God has a remnant today. There are Jewish people that get saved. Now, I've heard that it's about the same percentage of any kind of people. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. But you know what happened? Their blessings became a snare to them. Look at verse 9. He's quoting from Psalm 69 here. David saith, let their table be made a snare. Now, a table represents blessing. You know, all this God had laid out on the table for them. Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back alway. Um, God's blessing on Israel should have led them to Christ. But they began to trust their blessing rather than Christ. They began to trust their Jewishness uh, rather than uh, the Lord. Their religious practices, their, their position as the chosen, you know, very proud. God allowed them to harden their hearts. But you need to understand, this, this hardness, you know, God blinding their eyes, is not total. Some get saved, and it's not final. God is going to be working in the nation of Israel. Later on, we'll see, uh, verse 26, so all Israel shall be saved. God is not done with, with Israel. And the, the, the point I want you to consider here, not only is uh, what God is teaching us about Israel, but for us, us today, this same hardness can afflict us. Uh, there's people who think they're Christians because they've, some, they've done some Christian deed or they have some Christian heritage. Listen, God doesn't have any grandchildren. Uh, and God tells us uh, we're not righteous by the works of the law. Uh, there's nothing we can boast about. Uh, we have to come to God in humility, recognizing our sins. I find that there's people who trust the practice of Christianity rather than the Christ of Christianity. I talk to people all the time where people say things like, well, I say, are you, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I've been baptized. Or, you know, we, go to, we go to that church down there, huh? What, what's the name of that church we go to? <laughs> you know, really, really involved. Uh, I do this for the Lord. You know, they, they mention physical things. I've had people say this. I say, are you a Christian? Oh, I believe in God. Now, if you get the chance, I, I say to them, well, do you realize the Bible says that the devil believes in God? And it says that he believes and trembles. He even has an emotional response. But I can tell you, the devil's not saved. The devil's not a Christian. And there's all kinds of things that people are trusting in rather than Christ. I really enjoyed some of these songs as we, we sang this morning, you know, uh, hiding in him and, you know, all that he, he does for us. That's our only hope, folks, is the Lord. And it's the same for Israel. Uh, God has a future for Israel. You see the personal proof with Paul. You see the historical proof. God always has a remnant. And then you see what I would call the dispensational truth, what God is doing. Uh, with the, and he talks about the Gentiles and he talks about the Jews. He's not talking here about individuals. 
Uh, he's talking about groups. So let's read from verse 11 of chapter 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may pro provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And he's just talking about God has, uh, has a plan. Uh, God has told us ahead of time. Uh, he, he quotes here in chapter 9, Hosea, chapter 9, verse uh, 25. As he saith also in O.C., I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. Yeah, God has said, this is, uh, this is the way things are going to work out. Uh, you can just mark it down. God is never surprised at what happens. All right? <laughs> Uh, there's nothing you can do, and God will say, Ooh, boy, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> uh, God uh, planned this. God has a purpose, and Israel will be restored. Uh, just reading this morning uh, the verse in Jeremiah where he says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Do you know who that was originally written to? To Israel. God's love is not temporary. Uh, God's plan for Israel is not, is not temporary. Now, like I said, as Christians, we're spiritually children of Abraham. We're not, uh, unless you're Jewish by birth, uh, we're not Jewish uh, uh, physically or, or nationally. And you really can't understand history or prophecy or scripture uh, unless you realize the difference. Uh, the fourth witness that God calls, the third is the Gentiles, the fourth is really Israel itself. Look at verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. Now, this is a concept in the Old Testament, the first fruits, found in, in Numbers 15 and Leviticus 23. Uh, they would give a bit. They would give the first fruits, similar to the tithe, where, where you give the, uh, something that symbolizes that God owns it all. He says if the first fruits are holy, hey, God is saying that uh, he sanctified the whole. He goes on, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And he begins to talk about the olive tree. Verse 17, if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, he's talking to Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive, olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root they. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For well, God is able to graft them in again. A lot of words, isn't it? But he's just saying the, the picture here. Uh, God has, has Israel. They're the, they're the olive tree. They've had some problems. They've rejected the Lord. Many of their branches have, uh, have uh, you know, gotten diseased, and he's had to cut them off. And he's taken us, the Gentiles, a wild olive tree. He's cut us off and grafted us in. See, what he's saying is Christianity is not based on us. It's based on God, and God's people, God's basis is, the, is Israel. That's what the Old Testament's all about. That's the basis of, of our belief. He says, we don't bear them, they bear us. And we need to understand that. God has a dispensational uh, truth here that, that we can see. Um, the olive tree is so important for us to understand about Israel. Now, he's not talking here about individual salvation. He's talking about Israel's place in God's plan. I think we can put it this way. No matter how far Israel gets from the truth of God, the roots are still good. You know, the branches can, they can get pretty bad. But Jesus said in Matthew 22 that God is still the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So we see witness after witness uh, that God is not through with Israel. And our final witness, we're going to look at this mainly next week, but uh, verse 32 is God himself. 
For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Yeah, that's so important. Jew or Gentile, uh, the Bible says we're all sinners before God. And the only way we can have the righteousness of God is by faith, not by works of righteousness, which we've done. The Bible tells us, as we read in chapter 11, God has not cast Israel away. He set them aside temporarily. Now, right now, God's testimony is borne by Christians. That's true. Jewish people get saved. They become Christians. But Israel's rejection is not only not total, it's not final. Uh, look at verse 25 there. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, and I shall take away their sins. And what a blessing uh, to see. God is faithful. And it's so illustrated here with Israel. I mean, you read the Old Testament, you think, how does God put up with them? Well, how does God put up with me? <laughs> how does God put up with you? You know, time and time again, they, they, they go against him. And yet God is faithful. And God keeps, you know, like he says there at the end of, what is it, chapter 10, <coughs> all day long I've stretched forth my hands under a disobedient and gainsaying people. You know, that's the people around us if, that, that haven't trusted Christ, uh, rebelling against God. Uh, Israel will be restored. God will keep his promises. At the rapture, Christians will be caught away. And in the seven years that follow, uh, Israel's eyes will be opened. And God says he's going to send around 144,000 Jewish evangelists. It's going to be a, an exciting time. Uh, many will trust Christ. But you know what? Your time is now. Yeah, we can get all excited about end times and what's going to happen and when it's going to happen and so on. But listen, the time is now. Verse 32, God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. God's call to you. God's hands are extended. He wants to show you mercy. Mercy comes from the giver and he's offering it, but it also has to be received, doesn't it? You know, peace with God is only through Jesus. Righteousness is only by faith in Jesus Christ. I love Romans 5.1 where he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't get caught up with religion. Don't get caught up with yourself. Get caught up with the Lord. I'm trying to think, there was, there was a song, let's forget about ourselves, magnify the Lord and worship him. The main problem we have in life, we're so caught up with self. Uh, and, you know, we can be pretty self-righteous, just like the Jews. And we can say, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. God should be happy to have me in heaven. Now, listen, that's not the way it works, folks. Uh, we all fall short of the glory of God. Uh, there's no difference. Uh, my question to you this morning is, will you trust him? Trust him with your today. Trust him with your tomorrow. Trust him with your eternity. Uh, he's the only one who knows the beginning from the end. And he's, he's faithful. Let's go to him in, in prayer this morning. Heads bowed in, in an attitude of prayer. Maybe the Lord is, is speaking to you. Maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're counting on someone or something else uh, for your eternity. I would encourage you today. I would plead with you. Trust Christ. Father, we're so thankful that you love us. Thankful that you know us and you still love us. And Lord, that you sent your Son. You took our place. You became sin for us. Oh, Father. Thank you so much. Lord, we ask if there are, are any here this morning that are not saved, Lord, help them to see your, your wonderful love. Help them to see their, their lost condition. And Lord, to repent and believe, to trust you as their Lord and Savior. Help us as a church, Lord, to see that the time may be short. Help us to be sharing the gospel with those around us. Lord, we, we have friends and neighbors that are lost. And, and Lord, we, we really desire that they would hear the gospel and believe. Lord, change us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to sing uh, with me. I get uh, Neville to come and lead us in Only Trust Him. You know, I was thinking about that song, Only Trust Him yeah. Now, is the next word. Yeah. Only Trust Him Now. Let's, uh, let's stand and, and sing that. Maybe you need to come and pray.